But it is an honor to be able to stand before you today and, and share the Word of God with you. And, and as we look at God's Word, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 today. So you can go ahead, actually 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You can go ahead and, and flip over there. And uh, we're going to be talking about a, a message today called, It's All About Jesus. And uh, that's really what we as a church want to be about. That's what we as individuals want to be about. Everything in our life and in our church and our ministries being all about Jesus. Jesus. And so, um, you know, that's going to be kind of our unofficial mission statement as we talk about this today. And you'll hear me repeat that uh, many times. And so just to know that we're all on the same page, whether you're here in the room or on the uh, uh, Zoom at home or on Facebook, uh, let's just say that together, almost like as a prayer this morning. Can you all say that with me? It's all about Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we are so thankful this morning to be able to dive into your word and to, um, to talk about exalting you and lifting you up. Uh, Lord, help us to remember that everything in our life, from the uh, daily routine that we have, Lord, to coming together to worship and everything in between, Lord, is all about you. I pray that today as we look at this scripture, uh, you would help us to understand that. Thank you, God, for your graciousness, and uh, we just give you praise and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we're going to read these first uh, five verses today and, and kind of unpack them and, and discover what Paul is talking about and um, how he wants us to be all about Jesus just like he was. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 1, it says, When I came to you, brothers and sisters, announcing the mystery of God to you, I did not come with brilliance of speech or with wisdom. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not be based on human wisdom, but on God's power. Amen. And so I believe in this passage of Scripture, we can see three main things that uh, help us as individuals uh, understand what our mission is and what our purpose is in life and uh, can help us as a church understand what our mission and purpose is in life. And, and hopefully it will also help you to understand um, what I believe my calling is as a pastor, uh, what I want my uh, responsibilities at the, church, uh, at the church to be. You know, one thing that hopefully you guys got to watch yesterday on the Zoom call, and you got to hear a little bit about my story and my testimony. And uh, if you didn't, uh, but that's going to be there on Facebook. You can go back and you can watch that at, a, at another time. But one thing I didn't mention yesterday is that um, uh, whenever I talked about my calling is that whenever I went to college and God changed me from a direction of pursuing medicine um, to uh, pursuing uh, a, a call in ministry, I called my, my parents up and I told them and I, was, and I didn't really know what they were going to say. And, uh, and so I, I called them up. I told my mom and she was like, yeah, I kind of figured. And I was like, what? Where did that come from? And she said that whenever I was three years old, I said that I was going to be a preacher and a teacher and that she had grabbed hold of that and she had held on to that and believed that that was God's calling on my life all the way from the very beginning and that he was just then beginning to manifest that uh, in my life. And so I believe that, that this passage helps to direct a pastor on how he is supposed to, uh, to communicate the gospel and as well as a church and how we are supposed to be about the gospel as well. So let's look at a few things talking about faith as we look at this passage of scripture. The first thing that we see is that faith comes by revelation, okay? Faith comes by revelation. Uh, Paul says there, when I came to you, brothers and sisters, announcing the mystery of God to you. He said that he announced the mysteries of God to the people. When you think about mysteries, isn't there something about mysteries that tends to draw us in? I mean, I'll, you, you might be flipping through the channels and all of a sudden you get to, you know, like uh, one of those Friday night Dateline shows or something like that or Unsolved Mysteries and you, and you just get clued in. I mean, you like you weren't planning on watching mystery stuff that night, but man, it just sucked you in right there when through the channels. You know, that show Unsolved Mysteries was so popular, even all the way back, uh, be began in the 80s. Uh, and they've even got a reboot going now of Unsolved Mysteries on Netflix. And it's one of those things that, that draws us in. And we love the idea of mystery because we like to try to figure out what it is that happened. We, we think those detectives, they didn't know what they were doing. But I, you know, I can watch this TV show and I can figure it out, right? We love, we love mysteries. Well, Paul here is not, he, he's not announcing a, a, a mystery that's unsolvable. He's coming to these pagans, these Greeks, these Corinthians, and he is announcing the mysteries of the one true God. If Paul was the host of a TV show, it would be solved mysteries. It would be answering the questions and the mysteries of God. He explains this more in Colossians when he writes in chapter 1, 
I have become the church's servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. God wants to make known among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so Paul made it very clear whenever he wrote to the Colossians that his job was to announce the mysteries and and not just say, yeah, these are the mysteries, but we don't know what they are, but to insert all the clues that they had been waiting for for ages and ages and ages. And as we think about him writing to a group like the Corinthians and to the Colossians, these weren't uh, uh, primarily Jewish uh, believers. These These were primarily Greek believers, Roman believers, people who had not grown up in the Jewish faith, even though they may have kind of adopted the Jewish faith, the Jewish religion, they weren't by nature, most of them, uh, Jewish people. And so they had some of these questions like, which God is the true God? How can I know God? What is my purpose? And Paul says, this is it. I'm here to let you know the mysteries of the words of God. And it's this, it's all about Jesus. From, Revel- Revel- from Genesis 1-1 to Revelations 22-21, everything in the word of God points to Jesus Christ. And so as we think about that, as we think about faith and and what it means to have faith and how we have faith, we have to remember that it comes by revelation and the revelation of God and his word. Romans 10, 17 says, so faith comes from hearing and that is hearing the good news about Christ. Faith comes by hearing the good news about Christ. I believe our mission here at First Baptist Round Rock is to announce the mysteries of God. And not to be a a church that has the unsolved mysteries, but to be a church that is having the TV show, The Solved Mysteries. Let Let us answer the questions about how to know the one true God. People are asking questions about what is my purpose in life? Well, we have the answers in God's revelation. To understand that hope and, and uh, salvation comes by Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And that we can find eternal life in him. Peter says in chapter 1 verse 3 of, of Second Peter, His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. And so you might be thinking this morning, how do I know? How can I really know if God is the one true God or if Jesus really is who he said he was? Well, you can look through the word of God. This right here, this revelation that we have, this is all we need to know that God is who he says he is, that Jesus is who he says he is. Notice I'm using present tense because Jesus is alive. He died on the cross. He paid the penalty for our sins, but he rose again on the third day. Jesus is alive. And this revelation is all we need to know to be able to know him. You might be saying this morning, yeah, I believe those things, but man, I can't, I can't share the gospel with somebody. I don't know enough about the gospel to be able to share that with somebody. Well, I'm here to tell you today, if you've got the word of God, you've got all that you need for glory, for, uh, for godliness and for life is what Peter says. And so God has revealed himself to us by his word. That's one thing we can see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We also see that faith comes by the power of the Spirit. Faith comes by the power of the Spirit. Paul said in verse 4 and 5 of 1 Corinthians 2, he said, My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not be based on human wisdom, but on God's power. There's one thing that standing before you today, I can promise you, that, and you probably have already figured this out. I am not the best preacher in the world. I will never be the best preacher in the world. And uh, there are going to be guys that, that, that come after me that are better preachers. There have been guys before me who are better preachers. And um, the, I'm, I'm the kind of guy who list, likes to listen to the good preachers so that I can learn from them. And so, so that's, a, that's a truth that you've probably already figured out. But the reality is I don't have to be the best preacher And the reality is you don't have to be the best Sunday school teacher or the best Bible study leader or uh, even the best evangelist, the best person out. You don't have to have the the gospel presentation down frontwards and backwards, upside down and, and everything. And to be able to share the gospel clearly, because the power of the gospel is not in my ability to communicate. It's not in your ability to communicate. The power of the gospel comes by way of the Spirit. And so the power of salvation is not in a preacher or in a presentation. The power is in the revelation of Jesus and the power of the Spirit. I'll be honest, one of my favorite verses is Acts chapter 4, verse 13. And after uh, presenting the gospel and sharing boldly with the gospel, uh, Peter and and John, 
The, it says that uh, in verse 13, when they, being the religious leaders, it says when they observed the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and recognized that they had been with Jesus. I love the fact that these untrained, uneducated men amazed the religious elite. And it's amazing even in our own lives how sometimes those words of wisdom or those depth, the, you know, that, that depth of insight comes from people who, man, you're like, you're blown away that they would have that kind of wisdom because maybe they don't have a, a big train, a lot of training in their background, or maybe they don't have a whole lot of education, but they have a lot of experience in life and they have a lot of experience with the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit's very powerful in their life. I know sometimes our own kids surprise us with some, uh, some things that have a lot of depth sometimes. Um, my youngest son is, is seven now, but whenever he uh, was four, uh, Jackson said, uh, he was talking to Melody and, um, yeah, he's right there. He's, he's pointing at himself. Um, just in case you wanted to know which one he was. Uh, but, but Jackson said, I love you, mommy. And so Melody said, well, what is love? And we were expecting him to say, I love you means I love you, you know, or something like that. But he said, I love you means you're my treasure. Oh, and all God's people said, oh, right. <laughs> Such, you know, just sweet wisdom from a sweet little boy. But when you think about it, man, isn't that true? Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Whenever he said, I love you means you're my treasure. Man, that just, that hit us. And that's something that's stuck with us. Well, these guys, these were, these were kind of like those untrained, you know, and uneducated guys. They weren't, they didn't have training in religious history and theology or oratory skills, but empowered by the Holy Spirit. Just like they were on the day of Pentecost and all the way through their ministry, empowered by the Spirit, they clearly communicated the message of the gospel and they shared that message. And the Bible tells us that the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And those leaders who were amazed, Peter, no, uh, Luke notes, they were amazed and they noted that Peter and John had been with Jesus. The best preaching is merely words if it's not empowered by the Spirit. The best Bible study teaching is only words if it's not empowered by the Spirit. The best gospel presentation out in, in the culture, in the community, it's only words if it's not empowered by the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in John 16, 13, when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. As a church, we need to be empowered by and led by the living Spirit of God. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the, the gospel is clear that that spirit lives within you and he guides you and motivates you in your ministry. We need to be a church that all our, our ministries, our community service, everything that we do has the, has the ultimate goal of sharing the gospel empowered by the spirit. A.W. Tozer, who was a great pastor and theologian, uh, wrote, I remind you that there are churches so completely out of the hands of God that if the Holy Spirit withdrew from them, they wouldn't find out for many months. Man, aren't you glad that First Baptist Round Rock is not that church? Um, I've only known a handful of you guys, but I can already tell that this is a church that believes in the Spirit of God, that believes in the power of God, that believes in prayer. I, I have enjoyed looking through your website and seeing the, seeing the emphasis on prayer that you have at your church. And so I believe without a doubt that this church is, is poised to make a tremendous impact or really to continue making an impact in our community and in the world around us. And so we can see that uh, faith comes by revelation. Faith comes by the power of the Spirit. But also, thirdly, faith comes is in Jesus Christ alone. Faith is in Jesus Christ alone. And Paul makes this clear in verse 2 whenever he says, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And so what I want to make clear today and, and what we need to be able to make clear to our, our community and to our friends and to our neighbors, our family members, is that salvation comes by faith in Jesus Christ alone. It's not Jesus Christ and good works. It's not get all the good works ahead of time and then get Jesus. It's not Jesus Christ and being a member of a certain church or being a member of the right church or doing things a certain way. It's faith comes by Jesus Christ alone. And we as, as communicators, because all of us are communicators, right? All of us are communicators. We need to be able to share the gospel and share with somebody clearly that all they got to do is put their faith and their trust in Jesus. And as a preacher, I want to make sure that nothing detracts from that message. 
And now here's my commitment is that every single week that we come together and, and have worship. And I believe that preaching is a part of worship just as much as music is and as much as the, the prayer is. And uh, everything that we do whenever we come in here is a worship, giving glory and honor to God. But then whenever I come in here to preach and to open up the word of God, every single time we open up this word of God, we are going to share clearly the message of the gospel. That salvation is found in Jesus Christ alone. There may be somebody that you just can't quite get that, get that message across. And you can have confidence that if you can get them in this room, they are going to hear a clear message of the gospel. And that doesn't mean that every single week the message will only be a gospel presentation. But it means that no matter what the topic is or what the main point is, the gospel is going to be foundational to what we teach. L.R. Scarborough is one of the past presidents of Southwestern. I mean, he, um, he was just a tremendous man of God, a tremendous evangelist. And he said this about pastors. He said, he who sidetracks the gospel in his pulpit misses his greatest opportunity, belittles his call and shames his ordination. It is by the foolishness of preaching, not by foolish preaching, that God is to save the world. The gospel is what God ordained us to preach. The heart of the gospel is Jesus Christ. The glory of Christ is his cross. Listen to this. The crossless creature, uh, (laughs) the crossless preacher is a Christless preacher. The crossless preacher is is a Christless preacher. And so we will preach the cross. We will preach Christ because Acts 4.12 tells us there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. And so what does this mean for us? Well, it means that no matter what we do, either in this room or outside this room, it's all about Jesus. Your salvation is not about you and what you can do. Your salvation is about Jesus and what he has already done for you on the cross. And so we need to be certain of one thing, that Jesus is the way of salvation. Faith in him is the way of salvation. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. In who? Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. And so faith comes by revelation. Faith comes in the power of the Spirit. Our faith is in Jesus Christ alone. That is the message that we carry. And as we kind of finish up and, and think about this, uh, this, the salvation in Jesus Christ alone and us be, wanting to exalt Christ and lift up Christ, I want to end with, with four ways that we need to lift up Jesus uh, in, in our world. Uh, four ways that we need to exalt Christ. Because Jesus said in John 12, 32, as for me, speaking of his crucifixion, as for me, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. And I think that's a powerful message for us to remember because it doesn't say if I'm lifted up from the earth, then you can draw all people to yourself, you know, or you can draw people to me. He says, no, no, no. If somebody lifts me up, speaking of the cross, if if I am lifted up, then I will draw all people to myself. And I believe that message is still true for us today, that if we will exalt Christ, then the message of the gospel will draw people to faith in Jesus Christ. Like I said, it's not in our ability to communicate so you know, whimsically and, and, and passionately that it'll draw and convince people to come to, to faith. It's just sharing the gospel. If we exalt Christ, he will draw people to himself. And so let me share with you four ways I think we need to exalt Christ. First of all, we need to exalt Christ in our core. We need to exalt Christ in our core. This means that Christ needs to be the center of your life. Christ needs to be the, 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 the center of everything that you do. And, and so initially what this means is that if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you need to accept Jesus as your Savior. He needs to become the center of everything that you do. Because the reality is that we were born, we were created to be in a relationship with God. I mean, that's why you were designed. But it's because of sin in our life that that relationship that we had with God has been broken. And, and the fact of sin is that we can't get rid of sin on our own. None of us can ever be good enough to undo our sin because the scripture says you got to be perfect from the moment you're born to the the moment you die. And so if you had an imperfect moment, you can never go back and fix that. We cannot undo our sin. And so there had to be somebody to undo that sin for us. And that was Jesus Christ. He came and he lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for our sins and he rose again on the third day. So he conquered sin, he conquered our debt and he conquered death on our behalf. And if we put our full trust in him, then we receive his eternal life, which starts now and lasts forever. And so my question for you today is, do you believe in Jesus Christ? And whenever I say believe, I have to be careful about what I mean. 
Because here in America, we can believe in something, but you know, it doesn't necessarily have to affect us. I believe that it's a whole lot healthier for me to drink water than it is for me to drink Dr. Pepper. But I guarantee you, if you have a bottle of water and a bottle of Dr. Pepper, I can pretty much tell you which one I'm going to pick up. Okay? I'm going to pick up Dr. Pepper. I mean, after all, that's just what the doctor ordered, right? I mean, that's, that's what the commercials say anyway. Um, and so I'm going to choose Dr. Pepper, even though I know and I believe that water is better for me. Well, that idea, concept of belief is foreign to the Bible. In the Bible, belief requires action on that, on that belief. You have to believe it, and then it has to move you to action. So my, my, the word maybe we should use today is that, do you, have you ever trusted in Jesus Christ? You know, think about, think about a bridge. A bridge, you know, across a, a ravine or across a creek or something like that, it does you no good until you step out on that bridge, right? Until you put your full weight on that bridge and completely trust in that bridge. You can, you can see that bridge, you know, across the Grand Canyon or something like that. And, and you can think, well, man, I, I believe that bridge could get me across the Grand Canyon. But if you never step out on that bridge, well, then it's not doing you any good. But when you step out on there, when you put your full weight and dependence on that bridge and begin walking across, it'll see you across to the other side. And that's what Jesus is. He is a bridge from death to life. And so my question for you today is, have you put the full weight of your life in Jesus? Have you said, I'm all in, I'm stepping out on the bridge of Jesus and God, I'm trusting you to take me from death to life, to give me salvation, to give me forgiveness, to give me eternal life. Galatians, in Galatians 2.20, Paul says this. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. Therefore, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I live in the body, I live by the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The reality is when we step into Christ and we say, I'm all in, I want you at my core. I want you to be the center of everything that I do. Then Jesus says, all right, I'll take control. I'll take charge. And he, you know, he, begins, he begins working those levers in our life and directing us and guiding us in the way that he wants us to go. And so we need to exalt Christ at our core. We also need to exalt Christ on our couch. So I want to encourage you in this today. Exalt Christ on your couch. And, and this represents your home. You know, the, the center of the society that God developed was the home. He said that he wanted Adam and Eve to come together and to be fruitful and to multiply. And in, in, the, in the Jewish culture, one of the central teachings of Jewish culture is the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord, your, uh, the Lord is one. But at the, after that, he, he says this, uh, Moses says this, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These words that I am giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road. When you lie down and when you get up, bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your city gates. You know, if you put that in modern vernacular, it might say, hey, look, talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ when you're driving to sports practice or when you're going to drop your kids off at school or when you pick them up and you're heading to get ice cream or uh, whenever you sit down to take a meal, talk about the Lord. When you're tucking your kids in to bed, talk about the Lord. We need to have the gospel on our lips everywhere that we go. You know, a simple God bless you as you head out of a store or something like that. Share the gospel in little nuggets along the way. These words should be in your heart and on your mind and on your lips. One thing that my wife frequently says is that she believes one of the greatest contributions that she has in this life right now is raising these four kids down here. And I promise you, if there's anything good in those kids, it's because of her. <laughs> and uh, they might pick up a scrap or two from me. But Melody is a tremendous mom. And uh, that is really, that's the ministry that she has right now, is raising those kids in her home and teaching them. And as parents, all of us, and even as grandparents, our, our home, our couch is a place where the gospel should take center stage. And listen, that doesn't mean that every single night uh, in your home needs to look like a, uh, a church service, you know, with all your kids dressed up in their finest and sitting down on the couch all nice and, uh, you know, oh holy, oh, holy Father, please teach me something today. You know, it's nothing like that. Our, our devotions, our family devotions are anything but perfect. Uh, sometimes we got one, you know, jumping up, running into the kitchen to get a drink right about the time we're wanting to start or, you know, all of a sudden somebody's got to go to the bathroom right in the middle of prayer time. I mean, if you have a family and you have kids, Family devotions can be chaotic. But the goal is to just make sure we exalt Christ in our home. And all of us can do that. For those of you who are single parents, you may be, you may be discouraged because you're trying to be mom, you're trying to be dad, you're trying to put food on the table and trying to raise kids and keep all these balls juggling in the air. Well, listen, just be encouraged this morning 
Because not, God doesn't say, hey, be perfect in your parenting. He says, just trust me in this. He is, there is only one perfect parent, and that is God the Father. And if you look through the scripture, you see a lot of imperfect parents, but you see God using them to train up their kids to love him. And so be encouraged, mom. Be encouraged, dad. God has a plan for you and your parenting. And he says, I'm here with you. I'll walk through this parenting season with you. And if you will lean on me, the only perfect father, then I will empower your parenting. So we need to exalt Christ on our couch. We need to exalt Christ in our church. We've already talked about this some, but let me just talk about it just a, a bit more. We need to, all of our ministries to be all about Jesus, right? Have I said that before? We need to be all about Jesus. So we need to exalt Christ in our church. Um, you know, my, I'm excited about this, this opportunity to follow in, in, in this pulpit right here behind uh, pastors like Dr. Gary Brinkley and, and Jared Allen, who spoke the word of God right here uh, from this platform. And I believe that First Baptist Round Rock has a legacy of exalting Christ here in the pulpit, but also in the ministries that, that we have here as a church and in the mission uh, that we carry out as a church. And so we need to continue to exalt Christ in everything that we do, that we would be a place where people can encounter the love of Jesus in a very meaningful and real way. And that whenever they come here and their lives are transformed by the gospel in this place, they won't say, wow, what a great church. But they'll say, wow, what a great God. Because that's our goal. Amen. That's our goal is to point people to God. And if they say, man, this is a wonderful church, they'll say that because they've been transformed by a wonderful God. Paul wrote to the Ephesians. He said, now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. We want to glory, glorify God in the church. And if we exalt Jesus Christ, he will save the lost like only he can. And that should be our mission. And so we need to exalt uh, Christ in our core, on our couch, in our church, and then also finally exalt Christ in our community. We need to exalt Christ in our community, in the world around us. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 and through 16, he said, you are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And so we as believers and as a church, as, as, as the church together, but also as believers individually, we need to exalt Christ everywhere that we go. When we look into the community, when, we, when we're out in the community, we should be lifting up Christ, whether it's something intentional, like a mission outreach, or whether it's, it's just through our daily, uh, daily uh, day-to-day lives. One of the things that... Um, I, uh, uh, I, love, I, I was so happy to uh, discover is when we checked into our, our hotel, some of the, the folks from the Pastor Search team had, had left us a little gift, but they had also talked with the lady who they left the gift with. And, and um, as I got to talk with her throughout the week, you know, when we were interacting at the check-in counter or, uh, you know, in the food area or something like that, you could tell that she was impacted by those who dropped off, uh, who dropped off that package. And um, they were able to talk with her about the church and invite her to come to church. And she said uh, to me the other day, she said, you know what? I work on Sundays right now, but whenever I get my Sundays off, I think I'm going to come check out that church. I mean, and that's the message, that's the message of, of what we're talking about, exalting Jesus in the community. That was just day-to-day interaction. And so that's what we need to be. We need to be exalting Christ, lifting him up. And I love the way that this church does that intentionally. You know, you're your Christmas outreach, Christmas on the corner. Um, that was something where you saw that the, the activity was going on in the community. And rather than saying, hey, community, y'all leave that behind and come over here, come into our building and come be a part of what we're doing. We said, no, 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 we're gonna go to you and we're gonna be involved in what the community is doing and, and show, you know, exalt Christ in the middle of what Round Rock is already doing. And that's what we need to be about as a church is to continue to exalt Christ in our community. And so today, as we have talked about these things, we talked about how faith comes by revelation and the power of the Spirit, that faith is in Jesus Christ alone. We've discovered that everything that we do in life is all about Jesus. And so I want to encourage you this morning to make that the, the new unofficial, unofficial or official, whichever, mission statement of your life, that everything that you do is going to be all about Jesus. 
And for some of you this morning, that means that today is the day that you need to come to a place where you accept Christ in your life, where you make him the Lord and Savior of your life, and where you exalt him in your core. And so I want to ask you this morning, if you have never trusted in Christ, stepped out on that bridge and said, I'm putting my full weight of dependence in my life on Jesus Christ. Jesus, come in my heart, save me from my sin, forgive me of that sin, give me new life and walk with me now through this life. If you have never come to that place, then I want to encourage you to do that today to cry out to Jesus. The scripture says that all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so this morning, if you will just call out to Christ and say, I can't save myself. I need hope. I need, I need salvation in my life. And I know, Jesus, that it only comes from you. So this morning, Christ, I ask you, save me from my sin and give me your new life. The Bible's clear that he will do that. He will come in and he will uh, make his dwelling place in your heart from this day forward. And if you have made that decision, whether you're here in the room or whether you're, you're watching online, I want to encourage you to go to the First Baptist Round Rock website. You can go to fbcrr.org connect. And there's a connect card on there. And what we would love for you to do is to just take that, uh, fill out that connect card and uh, hit submit. And I know that sounds a little impersonal, but I promise you that a real person will contact you and will follow up with you and help you begin this relationship that you have made with Jesus Christ. And maybe you just still have some questions before you take that step. We would love to help answer those questions to, to make it, to help you go from unsolved mysteries to solved mysteries so that you know the answers that come from Jesus Christ. And so fill out that form and somebody will get back with you. I realize that most of us in this room and probably most of us online are already believers in Jesus Christ. But if we're honest with ourselves, are there times where we kind of walk away from that, where we step outside the direction that Christ has, has, uh, has for us? And rather than our life being all about Jesus, it's only you know, 75% about Jesus or mostly about Jesus or maybe a little bit about Jesus. Well, I want to encourage you this morning. Let's take that step back. Let's, let's get that foot off the land and step back out fully on that bridge of Christ and trust in him and saying, Jesus, it's all about you. I'm putting my full weight and trust back in you. I'm going to get rid of, let you get rid of some of these habits, some of these uh, things in my life that have been creeping in. And I want you to restore that joy of my initial salvation. You know, you may need somebody to help you walk through that journey as well. And so you can go to that same website, fill out that connect card, and, and we'll follow up with you to help you know how to make those steps in your faith journey. But when it comes right on to it, all of us, whether we're non-believers or already believers, we need the power of the Spirit in our life. And so I want to encourage you this morning to, to consider moving your life to where it is all about Jesus. Let's pray.